All right, so welcome to this session around managing MLOps at scale in OpenShift and Kubernetes. My name is Roberto Carratala and I'm a principal AI platform architect within the AI business unit working in Red Hat. And today we will discuss around different topics, but all related with uh, MLOps. So the first thing that we will do is explain what is MLOps, the challenges that um, we are facing when we are implementing MLOps, how we can implement MLOps at scale, and also live demos. We are uh, all of um, live demos and also the risk. And um, we will demonstrate how we can do MLOps at scale with OpenCF AI. So the first thing is ML what? What is MLOps? So the first thing is to the, um, define what is the um, MLOps, are the practices, culture, tools that I'm to efficiently deploy and maintain the different AI ML models in production. But for me, MLOps is a lot like DevOps, but for intelligent apps. And an intelligent app is an application where we have two different parts. We have part of the code was written by a human, and part of the code is a model that was created from data and training. And I have a question, which of these two apps is intelligent for you? We have app A, that is an insurance payment calculator app, and we have payment, uh, and we have application B, that is an insurance approval app. Any, uh, any clue around? That's perfectly fine. B, and for what reason? Because application A, it's static, needs no data to be created, just formulas and also is deterministic, always will provide the exact same data, the exact same outcome. But the application B is relying on a model that dictates if one application gets approved or not. And also this model was trained on previous data. And also all of this, even though the code is bug free, we need to monitor the different model to detect the different drifts. And that's the main difference. We have application A that is in static app, and we have application B that it's with this application and also relying on a model that forms a intelligent app. And finally, MLOps is the factory that allows you to put models in production with fewer risks. We always have a risk, but try to minimize this risk and also efficiently integrate this two life cycles between the model and also the application. And we are facing some challenges when we are deploying these MLOps. So this tiny piece is just the model code, but we need to understand that when we want to deploy the model in production, we need to also rely on other things, on other mo moving pieces like serving infrastructure, monitoring, analysis tooling, also all of this data collection and fine tuning and training. So we need to understand that we have a large complex uh, stack that we need to handle. And we have a lot of different challenges from the workload management. So we need to be able to deploy the model, to serve the model, to train the model with different data. We need to orchestrate every single thing like uh, in a an standardized and secure way. And we need to be able to scale easily from the very few nodes to large modes. And also when we are introducing more and more tools into the stack, we are adding more dependencies and we are introducing risk. So we need to be able to monitor and to get insights from the different models in order to know what's going on and also track this uh, model transparency that it's very important. On the other hand, when we are planning to do MLOps at scale, imagine that we are all of us, a team that we want to do MLOps and we want to be able to choose the proper stack. So we put in this room, for example, and let's do brainstorming. Let's bring every single tool that is meaningful for us and we wanted to implement the perfect um, stack. So we land in this. This is actual real. This is the 
Link Foundation AI landscape, and we have hundreds of different uh, tools, hundreds of different open source projects that we need to pick and also curate and teach how to um, use it to the different stakeholders. So this is not quite easy. And But our manager is super excited, wants to add every single piece of tech because uh, read a lot of Forbes, Medium and a lot of things that are very, very cool and wants to implement it straight away. And then it's super excited, wants to add a lot of different things and a lot of generative AI. That's super cool. And then uh, we are adding more and more complex, more and more complex and we land like this. We are in a mess. We have no control at all. And one takeaway that I wanted to emphasize is that doing MLOps and putting these models in production is not trivial. So every member of your team plays a critical role. And um, from the business leadership to the data engineers and ML, um, ML uh, engineers, every single one have different goals and different uh, things that uh, need uh, to do also in uh, this process to put in the model from, uh, in production, from gather data, develop the model, fine tune the model, and put it also in production and monitor afterwards. So we can do MLOps with open source projects because we can choose the different things, but still it's very complicated because we need to deploy the uh, different um, uh, projects uh, from open source as well in order to um, do the different steps in our MLOps pipeline. And we need to update it. We need to add a lot of different things. So it is still very, very, very um, uh, difficult to do it. So how we can help? Entering Open Data Hub. Open Data Hub is an AI platform powered by open source. So we picked the upstream projects and we created and we created this AI platform powered by open source. And then we have a product. Red Hat have a work that is called Red Hat OpenShift AI, like my t-shirt. And um, this Red Hat OpenShift AI is a product and is a platform for predictive and generative AI. So every single piece that you already saw in the MLOps pipeline, like for example, gather and prepare data, um, develop and uh, fine tune the model, deploy and integrate it also alongside with um, this application um, and development and also monitor. We have the platform that, in this case, we are covering different use cases. First use case, it's enable the different data scientists with a tool and with a platform in order to spin up very quickly different, um, for example, uh, I don't know, Jupyter Notebooks, but also VS Code, uh, Studios, every single um, option uh, out there. Also, we have model serving in order to deploy um, and, uh, our fine-tuned models in production. We have also model monitoring and, very important as well, we have the pipelines and the distributed workloads. So we will deep dive a little bit afterwards with our um, dive demos. And we need to understand how implement MLOps at scale. So for doing this MLOps at scale, we need to understand the principles and the processes. And the first thing that we need to know is that you need to design the flow that works for you and ensure that every single step is automated because we don't want to introduce manual steps because we know that could fail uh, also to train and retrain our, our, our models. On the other hand, we need to measure and validate everything and make it very easy for the data engineers and uh, also the data scientists in order to validate and um, test everything in their systems. So first thing that we need to do is model training at scale. We need to be able to give the data scientists and the ML engineers the um, capability to model training very easily and we need to be able to give them workbenches like Jupyter Notebooks, like um, Visual Studio Code as well, very easily and um, scale um, very properly. On the other hand, we need to be able to add managed batch training. And using distributed training, 
Im uh, improve the performance and scalability in order to meet this scale. So we need to be able to, um, without all of the hassle of configuring the Jupyter Notebooks, able to leverage the different GPUs. And then the, the data scientists don't need to worry about all of the underlying things. It's just uh, they need to worry on develop um, the code and train the model and that's all. And finally, be able to automate foundation models pipelines. So an important part here is to add the capability of leverage the GPUs at scale. The data scientists don't really, um, I mean, they don't care around the infrastructure that um, they are running the different Jupyter notebooks. They only care around picking the um, code, developing the code, and training the model in order to produce value to the company as well. So they need to be able to add these GPUs at a scale in the different systems. So we have here different um, notebook servers and different images. We have this um, notebook images that r can run only in CPU and also on CPU and GPU. And also we need, once we have trained the model, we need to be able to serve the model. We very easily can serve the open source models in a variety of frameworks because certain models only run in certain frameworks. We have TensorFlow, we have PyTorch, we have ONNX and others. And also we need to choose the different inference uh, servers. We will see that we are using VLLM, that is one uh, inference servers, but um, we need to be able to use others like KiteKit or uh, GGIS or others that are in the market. And finally, we need to be able to scale the different resources. We need to be um, able to, for example, run one replica first and then be able to scale under hundreds of different replicas in order to um, provide this service to uh, our end users. And um, who knows what is an LLM, right? All right, large language models. Um, is an LLM uh, or also called foundational models that uh, are models that were pre-trained with a large amount of data and they for example have a lot of information stored and in order to use this power um, we need to be able of also serve the different LLMs and the model servings as well. So we will do a um, live demo around deploying an LLM called Mistral, Mistral 7B, 7 uh, billion parameters trained in OpenGP AI with um, VLLM serving runtime. The first thing that we will do is go to our Red Hat OpenGP AI console. We have here the data connection. A data connection is just a, a way to connect the S3 um, bucket that um, it's an object storage where we deployed our uh, model. So we already deployed because uh, the model can, um, just give me a sec, the model can um, take a little bit and then we will also see the console here where we store the model. We have the different models and we are storing Mistral 7B. This Mistral 7B, it's a model um, that we already um, pulled and we have here the different safe tensors and as always, um, a demo uh, needs to fail um, in the state, so it's, it's brilliant. But on the other hand, we have here the possibility to deploy the model. So first thing that we are doing, uh, we need to put the name. We are deploying a model. Remember that we need to um, choose the seven runtime and this seven runtime is an VLLM. We are choosing one VLLM but we can use the uh, out-of-the-box seven runtimes like Kate key or OpenVINO or use another custom ones. In here we are using this framework PyTorch and then we are selecting the different flavors. In this case because it's a large language model we will use LUT obviously and we are selecting um, the data connection. Remember that already I pulled the data connection and we need to pick this 
that it's model Mistral 7B instruct V2. So we will go to the Red Hat console and then we will deploy. But takes a little bit of time, so I already deployed for the sake of uh, time. And uh, as you can see here, it's the exact same model. We are using framework PyTorch, model uh, server replicas, and so on and so forth. And now um, let's see if opens again. Ah, brilliant. I needed to uh, log in. So give me a sec that I will log in. And hopefully we will see in, in action. But meanwhile, I can explain it um, how is deployed the, the model until uh, this Jupyter Notebook is load. So we have here our Jupyter Notebook that is running everything from the console. So I uh, don't need it to add any command. And on the other hand, I have here my model that um, it's running, hopefully. Yeah, it's running properly and have different containers. One of uh, the container is the storage uh, initialization, but the other one, it's this one. And I can see the different metrics of memory usage of file system because it's important as well to monitor. So now, ah, keep waiting. All right, so we have it. Brilliant. So I need to put the endpoint here. We have the endpoint. I choose the endpoint and I already filled that until the Jupyter Notebook is failing. And I run all of the cells at once. The thing that I'm doing is first defining the endpoint and defining where is my uh, LLM endpoint. Then I'm defining also where is the model also the max tokens, so the max uh, tokens that I have uh, as a response, and the temperature. So how creative will be the model when uh, I ask something? And I will ask, what is the DEFCONF? And then this is not a pre-recorded. This is something that we are asking the LLM, and we are receiving different um, answers. So DEFCONF is a free annual community conference for developers, ID specialists, students, and science community. It's pretty accurate. In Central Europe. And then it's in Berno, Prague. And um, they have the main conference is in Berno. It's scheduled to uh, take place on Saturday, 16 February of um, 19. We need to remember that was trained with this data that could not be updated. So that's the first demo. And the second one, we will do rack. What is rack? Anyone um, knows about it? Retrieval augmented generation. All right, we saw that the model have not very updated information because have only this trained data. And I don't know, we can uh, train the model in 2019, but we need to update uh, the information of the model, right? How we can do it? Well, we will introduce retrieval augmented generation. So retrieval augmented generation is a technique that we are using vector database. So essentially, we are picking our private information or our update information, and we are picking every single, uh, every single uh, piece of information that could be PDFs or could be um, HTML. And we are putting these embeddings, so these vectors, in a vector database. And we are saying, hey, LLM, if you don't know this topic, then you need to go to the, um, this vector database, request the information, and produce an answer that is valuable for me with the updated uh, information. This is very, very useful because you don't need to retrain again and again and again your model. You need only to update the information that you are putting in a vector uh, database. And this vector database is very flexible because then you can interact with other things like agents. So let's see it in action. First thing that we will do is we will go to this chat. And this is an application that is powered by um, an LLM and have also the other thing that is a vector database. I use Milbus. Everything is running on OpenShift AI. And also, I'm using these documents, and I store these documents inside of the vector database. And I'm trying to get information. So straight away, what are two options to deploy my AIML uh, models in OpenShift AI? If I say this, 
I will receive an answer that could be not accurate. And in fact, it's not accurate. Because it's okay, but if I go to the link that is provided, it's not very, 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 very uh, accurate, right? Because it's not giving me the proper answer. But the LLM is instructed to give me straight away the, uh, the answer that could be accurate or not. So let's select the different documents uh, and the different PDFs that were trained uh, before. In this case, we wanted to select our marvelous Red Hat OpenShift AI self manage I'm no longer in pre-sales, by the way. Um, and then well, I will ask the exact same question. This question will be, what are the two options to deploy my AML models in OpenShift AI? And now, the answer is totally different. For what? Because it's giving me the proper answer in the LLM before of straight away answering me with the previous information, went to the uh, vector database, picked the um, proper information, and then presented me with the proper um, boarding and the, and, and the proper structure. And right now, we have the reference that are actually where we used to um, deploy the and, and to um, pick the information. And eff uh, effectively, we are having the proper information around serving models. So this could be trained and this could be stored with a lot of different use cases. Imagine that you have, for example, your private company and you cannot, uh, for example, um, go to OpenAI and ask uh, for this information because it's private. So you can do also RAC fully private in your own cluster in uh, on-premise. That's one of uh, the use cases. And this data will not leave the data center at all. More things that we will uh, see is that we need also, as you saw, model performance metrics. Now that we have already deployed the different endpoints and the different uh, models, we need to be able to see what's going on with our model. What is the performance uh, from this perspective? So we have a range of model performance metrics, as you uh, saw, and we have out-of-the-box visualization from performance that we can request and see, for example, this HTTP request. In this case, we are providing out-of-the-box certain ways, but also with Prometheus, you can uh, build your own. And as you saw before, we need to be able to automate things. And how we can automate things? We can use pipelines, and we need to be able to do this data science pipelines at the scale. So every single step that you are seeing here, I need to be able to put in a pipeline and use this pipeline in order to automate things. And once I have more data or once I need to retrain uh, the things, um, then I will uh, be able to do it. We have this example, but you can build whatever you want. And we will see one example in action that is having these data science pipelines at scale. So first thing that um, I need to do is again go to the OpenShift console. As you can see here, we have pipelines and I have this console in here. And I wanted to introduce one thing that is called Elida. Elida is a project and is an open source project that is a wrapper. For what reason uh, they created this? Because the data scientists don't want to know all of the hassle around the Tecton pipelines or our workflow pipelines because are very tricky if you don't know. And then the data scientists only cares about the code, only cares about developing things and don't care around this hassle of the pipelines and these type of things. And then they created this open source project that is called Elara Pipelines that essentially is a wrapper that allows to drag and drop very easily the different Python codes in order to create the things that we already see here that are the different steps. So we can grab these steps and we can use and create a pipeline in order to solve our problem and retrain, for example, a model or do certain things. In my case, the thing that I'm doing 
it's to try and to use this test response quality, test response time, and test security. So I am wanted to run this pipeline every time that I'm producing a new model. For what reason? Because I need to measure if it's okay, the response time. I need to measure what is, for example, the different responsiveness, if it's okay or not. And I need to understand if it's more or less uh, act, uh, acting securely in, and is not tampered. So if I run this pipeline and if it's not failing, all right. This will use as a backend KSF, uh, sorry, um, Tekton. This will um, be different pods from Tekton in a Tekton pipeline that will spin up pods and will produce with our code certain things and will um, deliver things like um, the logs and um, are stored in the different S3 buckets. So as we saw, we have the response, uh, risk times, uh, response time, we have the test security, and we have also the response quality. And afterwards, we will see, hopefully in a couple of minutes, the logs as well. So once uh, this, we will have, for example, the ability to um, summarize the results. And uh, we can also have the ability to schedule the pipelines in order to um, generate the pipelines and this type of uh, things at, uh, on demand or at scale. And finally, we need to be able to distribute workloads to enhance efficiency. So we need to be able to use different GPUs and different nodes and be able to scale uh, in order to train the different models in different uh, workers at the same time, because we need to not only um, work in one specific, um, I don't know, worker, we need to be able to scale. And with Ray and Codeflare, we can do this. One data scientist can use multi-cluster uh, dispatching and uh, could also do this dynamic scaling with different Ray clusters. And uh, with this, I think that we have not uh, more time, we can uh, do straight away the Q&A. So, any questions so far? All right. That's a very good question. I can repeat it. So the question is because of regulatory um, things in the EU, uh, in the EU um, and uh, because certain um, policies that we need to um, be compliant with, uh, is there any way to uh, do um, these policies or to fulfill these policies um, with OpenShift AI? In fact, yes. Um, we have a trusted AI that uh, we will have it uh, very soon, and uh, it's a way of uh, also add this type of uh, compliance and know um, things like transparency, things of uh, different drifts in order to uh, do this compliance. And also, um, we are investing a lot in order to be able to produce this transparency and to be uh, and to know where the data comes from. And uh, we are also instructing different models um, in order to uh, have all uh, the provenance, um, where the data is, uh, where the training uh, was for. And uh, for example, IBM produced one uh, grind models that uh, was with specific um, data and they are training in order to um, be compliant with all of these regulations that are not only in uh, Europe, also in um, other places all over the world. I don't know if I explain it. All right, any questions so far? Brilliant. So um, thanks for attending. And yeah, that was my talk. <laughs>